in tonight. Thank you. Uh, I'm stepping in tonight. Uh, Yolanda had a church commitment, so I will be the uh, chair this evening. So anyway, uh, all uh, welcome tonight to our regularly monthly uh, Places 29 Hydraulic Community Advisory Committee. Uh, we are scheduled for 5.30 to 7 p.m. tonight, so I will call this meeting to order. Um, this meeting is being held pursuant to and in compliance with emergency ordinance number 20A16, an emergency ordinance to ensure the continuity of government during the COVID-19 disaster. The committee members who are electronically present at this meeting are, if... I see, okay, I'm gonna go down. Uh, Bill Love. Yes. Uh, we have Diantha McKeel. Yes. Ch Chito, uh, Vito Teta. Yes. Uh, Cynthia Neff. Yep. Rosemary Miller. Yes. Chris Remble. <coughs> Is that a Chris? That's Chris, you got it. All right. <laughs> James Clemento. Yep. And Jody Saunders. Jody's Jody's on our committee, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Did I miss anybody who's on our? Oh, and uh, Julian Bivens is our uh, uh, liaison for the commission, uh, county commissioners. Um, all right. So um, the persons responsible for receiving public comment are the Places Twenty Nine Hydraulic Community Advisory Committee and Albemarle County Community Development Staff. The opportunity for the public to access and participate in the electronic <laughs> meeting are posted on the Albemarle County calendar. Please note that the chat has been disabled. If you send something in the chat, <clears throat> this will be sent to the meeting administrator. To ask a question or share a comment, use the raised hand feature to indicate that you would like to speak. Tonight we have um, several county officials, staff members present with us. Uh, Carolyn Schaefer, who is helping us tonight with the technical side of running tonight's meeting. Um, thank you, Carolyn. And Stacy Preetha, Preethi, Preetha is with us tonight, yeah. and she will be. Prethia, sorry. <laughs> and she will be speaking uh, later on and giving a presentation on the county's affordable housing. <clears throat> uh, did everybody have an opportunity to take a look at the meeting minutes from last month? And does anybody have any comments, questions, updates, additions, et cetera? Do I see any hands? Carolyn, are you seeing anybody? Nope. No. All right. Um, all those, uh, can I get a motion to, to approve? I see Chris has um, offered a motion and we have a second with Cynthia. Um, then all of those in favor, if you can unmute. Aye. 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 Excellent. All right. We have a motion that passes last month's meeting minutes. Thank you very much, Rosemary, for those wonderfully detailed minutes. Uh, so tonight we have two uh, wonderful guests that Diantha has been working hard to bring to us to talk about um, housing and community uh, in Elmar County. So tonight we're going to meet um, Harriet Kerr, is that, I'm saying that correctly? The um, International Rescue Committee Director. Um, and if she has her presentation. I guess this would be your opportunity now to. I mean, um, thank you. It's, is that working? Yep. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, well, thank you so much for the invitation. Um, I'm going to go through quickly, like some slides that just sort of talk in, in general about IRC and the work we do. And I want to make sure I leave. Uh, time for questions at the end. Um, this is sort of our general one. I have, uh, I can talk a little bit separately. Well, I'll, we'll I'll, I'll bring that up at the end. Okay, so let's see if I can make, oh, great. Come on. 
Okay, there we go. So just an introduction to the International Rescue Committee, our organization, we are actually a pretty old organization um, starting before the Second World War at the request of Albert Einstein um, to help bring people out of Europe and we're still going strong. Um, uh, actually, this is an old map, I need to update this, but basically this just sort of shows where we operate. We, we're actually um, opening new offices in uh, Iowa, in Des Moines, Iowa, and Louisville, Kentucky in the coming months. But this shows our where we are and around the world as well. Um, we're a global humanitarian organization. So I always tell people, I give this part, like if you only remember one thing of my whole presentation, let's, um, I wanna get clear on when we use the word refugee, what we mean. And I often tell people that um, the way I think of it in my own head is, I feel like there's like refugee with a little R and then there's refugee with a capital R. But because we use the word refugee colloquially, right? We talk about Katrina refugees and climate refugees and just anything that means someone who's been forcibly displaced from their home. And that is that is the meaning of the word. But when we use it here, um, we're talking about a specific, um, a specific kind of refugee that's a legal status as well as kind of what, what, what the person's going through. I've heard some people use the phrase political refugee. We don't necessarily use that, but we're, this is the uh, kind of accepted definition by the United Nations and US law. And the important element here is that someone who's a refugee has been, uh, the first element, they have to be forced out of their country. If you're displaced within your home country, you're a internally displaced person, an IDP. You have to actually cross an international border to be a refugee. But the, your, what has happened to you is based on a persecution claim. And that's what's really important to remember. So the refugees that were resettling, for example, here in Charlottesville, are their claim to that status is based on uh, persecution or well-founded fear of persecution. And that kind of goes through this list based on, um, you can read the slide. But that, that, I think that's a really important concept um, that um, people don't come through our program because there was a, a tsunami or an earthquake or something like that. That'll get you help, but it won't get you to the US. And the other um, status that until, let's say with, until the past year that we were working with a lot with the other one um, were special immigrant visa holders. They are not technically refugees, these are the uh, lately mostly Afghans, but Afghans and Iraqis who work for the US government or US forces. And then because of that work, they themselves became endangered and were granted a path to, they, they actually go through a process of applying for a green card, legal permanent residence. And so they, they enter with a, a visa and receive green cards very soon after arrival, whereas refugees have to, have to wait for them. Um, so we've received quite a, a lot of these people over the last years in Charlottesville. Um, we already had a significant Afghan uh, community here. And then with the SIVs coming a lot more. Um, I probably need to update these numbers already um, with these numbers are out of date because of Ukraine, but until Ukraine happened, they were current, but it's a staggering number of people are displaced in the world. Um, and it's so much more than even when I started um, working for the RC and when I started here in Charlottesville, but it's, you know, and it's, it's basically, come, and, and before, even before Ukraine, like one out of every hundred people on the face of the earth is displaced, is forcibly displaced from their home. And so it's kind of hard to wrap your head around the number of all the millions, but um, I don't even want to start, you know, tossing in all the, the Ukrainians. Um, but it's, it, this is, we used to say until just a year or two ago, we would say it's the largest displacement since the Second World War, but we have now uh, surpassed the displacement that happened at, at the time and following the Second World War. We are now in the middle of the largest displacement crisis in, in, in history. So when somebody becomes a refugee, they have to 
flee their home country, they're in another country, there's kind of three solutions to what can happen to them. The first and preferable solution is things get better in their home country and they go home. And that can take time, it does happen. Um, in my career, the, the time that I, I saw, we saw it the most was we, ha we had Liberian refugees. We, we have some here in Charlottesville still. Um, and at some point things like democracy was restored in Liberia, it's not saying things were great there, but things were restored, they were having elections, it was safe. And at that point, they, the people who were displaced in other West African countries were no longer eligible to be refugees. They basically were helped to return home. Host country integration just means the country that you get to, the first place you kind of cross into or where you land, you're able to make be safe there. You, they allow you to stay there legally. You can um, make a life there. You can work. You can access education. If you can do all of that, that's as far as you get. And then third country resettlement, which is what we do here in the U.S., is when A and B don't work, and over a long period of time they're not. You're you're you can't go home. You're you're being kept in very limited circumstances where you've landed, and going to a third country is the only option for your long term safety. Um, so I think we're we're kind of coming back to this, but um, we always used to say that half. You know, we we say that um, of all the refugees that are in the world, only about one percent ever get the opportunity to be resettled in a third country. It's actually a very minuscule number. And of those, that 1%, half of them traditionally came to the US. That was not true during the last administration, but um, I think we're working back to that level. Um, this is just sort of shows the very careful vetting process. We always say that refugees are the most carefully uh, vetted immigrants that arrive in this country. Um, it's usually somewhere between an 18 to 24 month process to get here. Um, they, they're, and usually the registration, their refugee case is created by the UN, the United Nations High, High Commission for Refugees, High Commissioner for Refugees. They'll kind of do the first pass, hear the person's story, do they meet the qualifications, the legal qualifications, set up a case. Um, and then you know they can that can just drag on for years and years. And then once they're but once they're um, referred to the U.S., they go through this very complicated process with multiple in-person interviews, in, including an in-person interview with someone from the Department of Homeland Security. They have to go through lots of security checks, a medical screening, all these things before they finally get the opportunity to come to the U.S. And a refugee arriving in the U.S. must come through a resettlement agency. You can't just randomly get on a plane. You have to be, you know, you, you're brought into the program and you are, everyone is assigned to a resettlement agency somewhere. Um, there's nine national kind of networks of agencies. IRC is one of nine that um, have offices all across the country. Um, so this is just sort of, you see our numbers are all like kind of up and down over the past years. Um, so, you know, the 2016 was kind of the, that 284 refugees was the largest number until uh, this past, this current year actually that we've ever resettled. Um, but you can kind of see how with different things going on, it was up and down, but um, I don't know, let me see if I got, anyhow. Uh, but just to sort of share the services that we provide, obviously our resettlement case management, that's our initial resettlement services is key, but we have a lot of other stuff going on. Um, employment services, because obviously as soon as people get here, we start to talk to them about you need to get a job, get a job, get a job, um, because people have, uh, they have some money when they arrive, but they basically... Uh, refugees are expected to be self-sufficient through earned income, through employment, uh, within three to six months of arrival. That's the expectation. Uh, we, have, we help people with uh, access to medical and mental health services. Uh, we do a lot with school and youth uh, programs. We do legal immigration services, and our immigration services are obviously for our clients, but they're open to the whole community. Anybody um, in Charlottesville can come in seek immigration services from us. 
Um, we do on-site educational program. We have ESL on site. We do a lot of um, kind of life skills and job readiness training and financial literacy and things like that. Uh, we run an interpreter services program. I know that County is one of our clients, our customers. Uh, we have trained interpreters who work with us for our own services, but we also uh, have contracts with other agencies uh, all around the community who uh, we, we send our interpreters out for their uses. And then our New Roots Food and Agriculture Program. So I'm going to zip through. I'm not going to read through these, but just these go into each area. I, and it's also important to note that we work with people when they first come, but we um, are funded in a lot of these areas to to support people uh, for at least the first five years they're here, like on an ongoing basis and depending on the funding source, even longer. Um, we, it's not that, uh, if anybody tells you that we only help people for three months and then we don't do anything, that's not true. Um, our, our, our cash assistance may be limited, but our services are, go on for quite a while. So um, obviously, yeah, employment services is a really robust and important program. And we also then to continue on with that, we have career advancement because we often push people into a very entry level job when they first come just because they need to get working and it takes longer to, and people need to have, they really need to have American work experience on their resume to start to move up the career ladder. But we, we work with people um, if they are coming from a profession or you know they have uh, other needs. Um, for example, right now we're working with um, TJs and PVCC on a healthcare uh, a programming to get people into different allied health careers um, where we're doing um, special uh, support uh, kind of training with supportive services on English and things like that to help people get through. Um, kind of our health programming, uh, just helping people, you know, get access to health services, um, make sure they they can get that. We have, um, oh, they're so cute. Anyhow, um, our, uh, we do a school orientation for all parents, make sure the kids get enrolled, make sure they all you know, know what's going on. And then as if any issues arrive, arise in the first couple of years that the students in our school systems, we have staff who can, can troubleshoot. We, do, we have some special uh, mentoring programs for high potential youth. We also try and make sure um, as much as possible that kids are getting into summer programs. We have a lot of kids going into summer programs this year. There, there's really, and, and there's really the, the need, especially with all the Afghans who have come. Um, and our immigration services um, and, and immigration education programs. We're, uh, we're actually just launching another, another uh, um, well, we've, we've been on a long-term push to get people naturalized as citizens, um, but we've also been, uh, we actually are even pushing on voter registration again. It's time, it's that time. Um, educational programming. Um, and our interpreter services. And now adding Ukrainian as best we can. Uh, and I hope some of you have driven past some of our gardens. Um, if not, uh, we are also a, um, a member of the Food Justice Network. Um, we've got five locations. I think several of them, in, our farm is in the county. We're, um, uh, we're, on the, we're on the other side of the creek from, uh, what, uh, Oh, great. Now I'm going to say that and then I'll blank out on the name, Azalea Park. So we, we're renting the property on the other side of Azalea Park, which just over the line is our farm. There's eight acres over there. Um, and, uh, and then we've, but we've also got several other sites sprinkled all around. Um, I added this in um, just recently uh, because I know there's a lot of questions about Ukrainians. This is, uh, so this is a little wordy and I can also share it with you because these are links if people are interested, but um, the Ukrainians, um, they're not technically refugees, right? They don't have refugee status. They are being allowed to come to the US um, 
actually I can back up a little bit. The Afghans who came on the evacuation flights that we got so many in here over the, they, they came in over the summer and then started coming to us mostly uh, in the fall. Um, actually are, they have a, it's called a humanitarian parole. It's not a permanent status. It's a two year temporary status, but it, you know, they have options to then apply for a more permanent status in different categories. And so what they, they're doing right now for the um, Ukrainians is something very similar. They are being given the opportunity to, to enter the US with this humanitarian parole. It gives them like two years. One, I think they, they have two years uh, a status. And at the end of the two years, they, the hope is either they're, they're going home or they, are, they find another way to be eligible to stay in the US. But what's different about the Ukrainians is they are not arriving through the formal refugee resettlement program. They um, are being allowed in if they have, but they're, they're, um, they have to be, have a private sponsor. The private sponsor can be relatives of family members, or it can be, um, you know, there's church and civic groups and just private individuals who are offering to to take in a, a, a Ukrainian family. That program is called Uniting for Ukraine. So basically when that launched, I think there were, there were definitely a few Ukrainians who came in, like there were people just kind of coming over the Mexico border for a while in small numbers. But once this program got launched, which would have been in April, um, they, Ukrainians are now only able to enter the U.S. with a, some kind of a sponsorship, but there's so many people have stepped forward volunteering to sponsor a family that basically they're just sort of holding them. If, if they, um, I think the ones people are like in Europe are actually able to arrange that before they even come. And if, if not, they show up at the border, they just kind of hold them there temporarily until they match them with a sponsor and then, and then send them onward. Um, and like I said, if they have relatives here, that can be, but they get this temporary status. Um, so that's how they're entering. So it's a little bit different, but then just like two weeks ago, uh, May 21st, they, um, decided that they could be, have access to all the serve the ongoing services we provide, um, with, with government funding. So they don't, have the resettlement program, the, the kind of first part of the resettlement program where we find them housing and kind of get them at the airport and all that. They need to be doing that through with a private sponsor, but they can now walk into our office. They are eligible for like, you know, SNAP, you know, food stamps, Medicaid, cash assistance, and then they can walk into our office and ask for help finding a job, getting, uh, you know, access to medical care, enrolling their kids in school, uh, things like that. So um, it's kind of a really different way of doing things that may be the wave of the future, we don't know, um, but we're just still negotiating that. So um, we're, I don't think there are tons and tons of Ukrainians in Charlottesville. There is a significant community in Harrisonburg, which some of you may be aware of, they have a store community there. And there there's definitely some in Richmond, we just know, I could probably count on one hand the ones I'm aware of, but they are starting to reach out to us and, and ask for services and we are helping. So if you hear of, of anyone, you know, kind of, kind of meets these criteria, um, please do reach out to us. Um, so, okay, you're not here. To, <laughs> you're not potential donors, but that, maybe you are. But anyhow, just sort of things, if you want to stay up with the IRC and you want to, um, uh, we're always uh, obviously uh, looking for donations. We are interested um, if people or, you know, employers who are looking, you know, looking for uh, people to hire, we're always looking for job leads. Um, if you're interested in advocacy at the local, state, or federal level, um, we're interested in meeting people in that. Um, and then we have our, our sponsorship program that we're working on now. Um, we have a lot of, we have about, we have more than 20 uh, volunteer groups right now that 
through mostly through churches that are sponsoring refugee families, like through their, their church group. Um, so that's like, uh, that's like everything I know really, um, really fast. <laughs> Um, and I don't know if you are interested in knowing more about like the, the Afghans or stuff like that, we can talk about as well, but I'm going to just be quiet and see if there's any questions. Thanks. All right. We got, um, looks like Bill has got his hand up. Yeah. Uh, so I'm trying to sort of match up this presentation with what I've been reading about refugees at the Southern border. Yeah. My understanding is that people who come in and apply for asylum have to go through this lengthy process. They can stay in the country supposedly, and, but, but uh, there has to be an adjudication. It can take years, I guess. Yeah. And I'm just wondering in terms of the people that you deal with here, how many of those people have been like finally approved and how many are still in this process waiting for some sort of final resolution? Okay, so the people that are like, for example, people coming over the border, we don't call them refugees. Like that, whenever I said like the little R and the big R, like capital R, whatever, they, they're like our term that we use would be their asylum seekers. So you, you, you know, you come to the border, you request asylum in the US and the criteria for asylum, it's almost the exact same definition as the criteria to be a refugee. It's saying that it's based on a persecution claim. And uh, there is, uh, in the UN, like the, the bylaws or whatever, the UN charter, it says that people should, someone coming to request asylum should not be pushed back. That's like pushed back into a country of persecution. That's kind of one of the bases. But so they can, uh, you know, request their, they can be put into detention until it's adjudicated or they can be released with a future date and they can, it's a judicial procedure. Usually they, they have to go before a judge. Sometimes there's an administrative version at the uh, immigration services office, but yes. It, and so it's whenever, then you show up at your court date, but you're supposed to be showing documentation of you know, your persecution claim and whether or not you're eligible for that status. We cannot serve, okay, with our usual package of federal funding, we do not serve people. They have to, if someone's been granted asylum, the day they get that court order, they can walk into our office and get benefits. But when someone's an asylum seeker, uh, they are not eligible for our services unless we have like a private donor that um, is doing that. And we don't really do that in charge. So we do have IRC offices along the Southern border that have private funding to provide some services, but not with not with government money. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes, thank you. Yeah. All right. We have uh, Chris has got his hand up. Well, the, the, the first question is, I noticed your list does not include uh, people based on the, her sex. It's only about other things. And I you was wondering- like, Are you talking about like gender? Gender. Yeah. Victims of sexual violence are not included in the. No. Uh, well, no. That's that's always the yeah. That's the touchy thing. It. Um, I would say for refugee. Yeah. I. I think, uh, and this is more for like people coming to the border and request. It's not, it, yeah, it doesn't really meet the refugee definition. Um, we have, you can use, um, I have met people who have been granted asylum based on like gender, like people who are trans and things like that, and can show that that opens them up to persecution. But I think the idea is like, it's not you know, one thing you have to be able to show that you are a member of a persecuted, you know, group or a persecuted class by the whole group usually to, to be able to gain that status. I don't, you know, and if you're applying for asylum, it, you know, it depends on the judge and how they interpret it. Yeah. Okay. The, the second question I have is when you try to settle people, are they try, are they settled all around the county? 
or there's certain areas that get more settlement mm -hmm. I'm specifically thinking there's a lot more settlement in our area. So in Charlottesville, so we are required to, people have to have access to public transportation. So basically the public transportation network limits where we place people when they first mm -hmm. come, unless they are moving in with relatives who, you know, mm -hmm. guarantee that they will get them to all their appointments and things like that. So for the most part, you're correct. Like in charts where we mostly resettle within the urban ring. Yeah. Um, and, the reason and, I ask is yeah. it, puts a, it puts stress on schools. I mean, yes. I have no problem with it. Our neighbors are Afghani refugees. Yeah. And, you know, we, we, we deal with them all the time. They're wonderful yeah. people. So, but, but the thing is, it does put a stress on the school system here. Yeah, that needs to be figured out at the county level. Well, there was this has been a while. This is probably eight or ten years ago. But I know we went and um, we went through a series of meetings with the the county and the schools and everything. And what what finally happened is um, I think I've told the story to Diantha. But at some point, um, someone took the where the schools were and then they overlaid a map of the uh, public transit system and. There, you know, so that that's on the other part that's aligned is where there's multifamily. So also it's like where you've zoned multi because they're saying like we got lots of room at Woodbrook. Well, what's at Woodbrook? It's single family homes off of transportation. So it's 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 a you know kind of it's it's a, it's a little bit of a planning issue too. But like all the you know the the area where all the multifamily and apartment complexes not all but the majority or a heavy preponderance of them are all the ones that are feeding back into you know jack jewett and buford and and, and i'll and just add that. to that I, so it's I, really interesting yeah yeah i just want to add to that is what we also discovered harriet and we've talked about yeah. that, that time when we were doing that study is that the majority of the apartment complexes that returned a phone call yeah, it was will and we're willing to take the refugees. Yeah, were located in our urban ring area. Also, yeah. So you do have. Yeah. I have, think we have to say there is pushback from some of the managers in the apartment complex. Yeah. Yes. The, on taking them, I think. Yeah, it's just like no, no one, no one here. Like I'm sitting here looking up and down Commonwealth from where our office is, and <clears throat> like no one will take the newly arrived refugees on Commonwealth, for example. Yeah, feeding and feeding further up, but there's, yeah. Um, I happen to catch Cynthia's hand before I saw others, so I'll I'll go with Cynthia next. Thank you. I I am uh, I'm curious about the Ukrainian um, assistance in this because I've heard of a couple people saying that they want to, you know, adopt a family from Ukraine. Mm -hmm. But it was like, are they really expected to provide a home and help them get a job and do all of that? Um, I can send it. They're supposed to identify housing or I, I think they're I, I actually ha I have not seen the um, I'm, I've not read the actual like documents that they have to sign something. I'm not sure how like strict it really is. But um, but they can now just since like you know two weeks ago or three weeks ago they can refer them to us and we will help them find a job. But we're not offering to find housing. Um, yeah, I just have to believe that's a huge issue, and I, yeah. and it's and I feel for people that are have arrived here and then they have to you know try to find a job and. It's just you know how that all happens it's a, is it's a lot. Yeah, a I lot. would say. You know, most of the, if the Ukrainians who are coming to the US are mostly coming here, not all, but I say mostly coming here because they have relatives or friends here. I think people, you know, with less means are staying in Europe where they, you know, where it's closer by. Mm -hmm. um, I think, I think usually if people come to the US, they have a reason, so. I saw Vito's hand next. Uh, yeah, Harriet. Um... You say 4,200 people have come here over the last many years. Uh, do they all remain here or do they intend to go back home and do go back home? Refugees? Yes. So basically the whole point of refugee status is that you you have no, 
you you you're, you can't go home again. I mean, it may things may change over a long period of time, you know, but like people like people flee. They they don't show up here like a year or two later. Like that's like what's happening with the Ukraine stuff. Like that's really unusual. The I think the last time I looked, they said the average time of displacement before they come here is 17 years. You know, like if you've met like the Bhutanese, it's, it's, and that some of that is intentional because they kind of, they want to see if it's possible that things clear up in a year or two and you can go home. It usually people are displaced for very long periods of time. You know, I don't know if any of you met the Bhutanese that we worked with for so many years, but I mean, they were in camps for like 22 years before they started the resettlement Jeez. process. Wow. You know, it was really like a whole generation had, had grown up. And um, so it was 18 years, it was like 18 to 25 years. And so it's, you know, for whatever reason it is, it is really, really a drawn out process. I mean, when we get people like, you know, Syrians or Ukrainians, like, they come to us three or four years after they left their homes. That's like really fast. Um, that's part of why it's been really challenging for us to work mm. with like the, the, the Afghans that have come recently because we're not used to dealing with people who like, they like left home and they're like here like 24 hours later. Like that was really, that's very actually very challenging for us. Kate? Oh, did you? Yeah, go ahead, Kate. It's me. Uh, yeah, um, it is. I think here several years ago, you met with this. I'm I'm with the school board. I'm the Albemarle County School Board, and I think several years ago you met with Dean Tistad and talked about it. And the information I have secondhand now um, was that yes, urban ring, but in the past decade, it's flipped from maybe ninety percent in the city to about ninety percent in the county. And within the county, and maybe that's not quite yeah, right, yeah, yeah. But disproportionately yeah. county. Yeah. And within the county, it's disproportionately in Jack Jewett. Yeah. And and it has a huge impact on our schools, particularly mm-hmm. Greer, Jewett, and uh, well, it's Jewett is not Jew- well, Jewett's Jewett for another couple of weeks. Um, and then it'll be Journey, <laughs> but um, in Albemarle High School. And um, so I'm, I'm glad that we're also going to be talking about housing policy because affordable housing eventually could help all of this, but it is, and transportation, but they land in our, in our district, yeah, um, they do. at Thank least you. initially. Yeah. yeah, it's definitely, we have flipped from majority city to majority, but it's not 90%, it might be more like 70%, but, but part of that is hearthwood and like availability like that was always the favorite place but a lot of the uh kind of town homes is the places that were in the city more and more they're being taken over by students and and the prices are going up so it's, mm-hmm. and we are but, but but yeah we're i mean it's it's university heights and then and then all these apartments on angus road and um off a of hydraulic and and just you know all down by Best Buy and stuff. That's where we're putting a lot of people. James? Yes, um, I have a question about uh, climate refugees. Are you seeing that potentially growing in the next 20, 30 years? Or I mean, is that really happening now? Because I didn't see it on your list either for the kinds of refugees coming. So they, they, a climate refugee doesn't get you a trip to the US. It doesn't get you refugee status so it's a it's a big issue and like for the IRC as a global organization it's clearly a source of displacement but it doesn't get you admission to the U.S. as a refugee at at least not now it it has to be that persecution claim it the definition is really um pretty limited Julian hi there so I'm just looking for a bit of clarification if you would so I guess a couple of years ago, this, this, this organization in Charlottesville called the International Neighbors of Charlottesville, which I actually thought was you had rebranded yourselves, but clearly you haven't rebranded yourselves. So if, you, if it's easy or if you, and you can say, no, we haven't rebranded ourselves, that's something else. But I was trying to figure out sort of how the, what's the nexus between the two organizations? They're a completely separate organization. Uh-huh. Um, and 
yeah, it's a, it's a separate organization. And so, so is it connected to an international network like you are, or is it just- No, a I, think, I think it's, look, I, I, it seems to me like they have been connecting up on their, with uh, similar organizations in other communities. I see them like referring to that, but it was founded as a local organization by an individual, yeah. Diantha? Yes, Harriet, thank you so much for coming tonight and sharing this great information. I have a couple of um, just comments. Have you been involved in the work that we're doing at the Regional Transit Partnership about transit because it's critical to serve your the population yeah. that you're working with? Yeah, I, somebody just reached out to me like last week about trying to bring people in a focus group. And I, I said like, not right now <laughs> because it's, it's a lot like, if somebody asks us to organize the people to come, it's like, it's a lot of work, but I do think it's important. Like, I, I do think we need to find a way to get our clients in there. We just need, uh, need to find a solution to how to like bring people in and, and organize it. Cause every, anytime we're like doing outreach and trying to organize things like that, it's extremely time consuming. So we well, see a better way to do it. Yeah. We have a, a, some plans that are moving forward and it would really be important Right, to have you all at the table. Yeah, yeah. Focus groups and outreach. Yeah. And one thing that would really be important, I think, for the work um, would be to understand really, I'm not sure the transit folks, the consultants and the people actually really understand where your your refugees are being located. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yeah. So maybe you and I'll have a, 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 yeah. a chat about this off you know. Yeah, we can talk about that because we do yeah. know like what complexes work. I mean, it comes and goes, you know, like this right. one won't work with us and they will. And then that one, you know, so there's, it's kind yeah. of shifting a lot. But, but yeah. there has been sort of a, more of a, a location that's been pretty stable over the last decade. So anyway, you know. Yeah, there are. And I have one other quick question. Um, and I know we're probably running short on time, Kim. I'll, but um, would you just let people know where you're, where <laughs> where we are located now yeah I just want to make sure because you reached out to me recently about people trying to get to your new yes. station and transit so just quickly yeah. so you may may or may not know we we our office was downtown like across from like city hall for 17 years but we moved in december and we're now with you so <laughs> <laughs> so we're at 375 greenbrier we're at the old greenbrier movie theater um, AKA across the street from the emergency vet. That, I found that to be the most reliable way for people to know where we are. Um, so we have the second, we actually, we're now, we've got the first and second floor of the buildings and I just heard somebody else is moving in on the third floor. So um, but that's where we are now, but it was a little challenging because the nearest bus stop is at the corner with Commonwealth. And I, I had always assumed that there was a bus stop on uh, 29 and there was not. Uh, which but is too bad like the bus out. drives right in front but does not stop so but that, I think that was worked it out maybe with Richard Hewitt didn't you or something about the we bus. had a long conversation and it involved a thirty thousand dollar bus stop and uh it, it's like wow <laughs> we didn't it didn't yeah I'll tell you the story sometime we'll talk some yeah. more but yeah it's like it's, it's out there it's out there Okay. Well, I have I have one quick question before we yeah. move on to our next guest, and that is um, within your organization, as you're helping people um, understand American culture or American um, movement, and since we're talking about transportation, do you, having lived in other places in the world where people just sort of go across the street wherever they feel like it, have you been able to talk to people about using appropriate crosswalks and whatnot? And I say this only because I was on 29 just in front of uh, the Price dealership, almost by where Gander Mountain had been, and a woman, she was wearing a head covering, had her child in a stroller and was crossing 29. And I don't know if maybe she was going to Walmart, <laughs> And she just needed a place to cross. But anyway, that was terrifying to see happen. Yeah. So is there a way that you all communicate with people about 
how to move about the community in ways that yeah. don't make people feel very afraid. We, we have a cultural orientation program that we provide that includes like how to use public transportation, but it, it goes by very early when they come and pretty quickly. So it's probably something we need to revisit. But there's also what we tell them and then what they choose to do. This is true. Just like so many things. Um, yeah. Yeah. All Thank right. You. And then I think that is, um, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, that also tells you we don't have a good enough walking or bicycling system in well, our county. That, that well, is very go. true. That is yeah. very true. But in the and meantime, if, we, if we had that, this would not be a problem. This is true. Yeah. All right. Oh, thank you again so much. Thank for you that so much. That was I'm gonna uh, very helpful. Log off, but thank you for the opportunity. Yep. Thank, thank you. you. Okay. Bye. Uh, all right. So tonight we also have uh, uh, Stacy with who is the Albemarle County Housing Policy Manager, and she is going to give us a um, overview again. I, she has been with us before in the past, and I think we're going to learn a little bit more about the affordable housing policies updates with the county. Yeah, so give me one minute while I share my screen. Um, which one do I need? All right, can all of you see that? Yes, we can see it. All right. Um, so I'm going to go through most of this really quickly. I did share the presentation. Um, it should have gone out with your uh, meeting materials. Um, <coughs> so I don't want to spend a lot of time on it. I have been here before. But I feel like it's important to give a refresher, and sometimes I need one myself. <laughs> um, so this is just a real quick overview of what we'll talk about. So again, what is housing affordability and how do we measure it? Um, who actually lives in affordable housing? Uh, what does it look like? And then we will look at um, housing needs in Albemarle County specifically, and then what the response has been so far. Um, and so you've probably heard this before, but affordable housing is basically housing you can afford with the income you have. It's that simple. Um, if you have uh, any monthly income of $100 a month, then you should spend $30 a month on your income. Um, if you have $100,000 income per year, that should be $30,000 of your income on your housing. Um, and that's really set at the federal level. And that 30% rule, or, or I shouldn't say rule, guideline was really set in 1981 and it hasn't changed since then. It's gone, it had gone up and down uh, before that. So at one point it was as high as 45% um, and sometime early in the early 20th century, it was somewhere around 25% of income. So it fluctuates, but 1981, they set at 30% of income and it has stayed there. And that's really housing specific costs. So if you're a renter, that's the monthly rent that you pay as well as the utility costs. And for homeowners, that's your mortgage payment. Um, so your principal and your interest, the property taxes you pay, mortgage insurance. Um, utilities are often not included with homeowner um, affordability. And I honestly don't know why, that's just how it is. Um, so looking at a household budget for a home health aid. Um, and so they, in general, uh, it's about a median uh, salary of 22,000 a year. Um, that's a monthly income of about $1,800, which means they can afford to pay $562 a month in rent. Um, so that's where the pie chart comes in. Your 30% is off there to the upper right corner. And that would leave $1,300 a month for everything else. So food, um, healthcare, transportation, buying clothes, um, going on vacation, doing all the things that we, as we, we like to do as, as people who have more money. Um, and so this is really just breaking it down number-wise. Um, what our general, what, what their salary would do in our current housing market. Um, and so, a median rent for one bedroom apartment in Albemarle County is about uh, just under $1,200 a month. And so based on the annual income for a home health aid, home health aid after you accounted for that market rate rent, 
Um, she purchased the groceries, paid for transportation costs, her utilities, and her health care. She would actually, or he, would not have any money. She'd be uh, negative $598. So that really points to the importance of making sure that we have a wide variety of housing at different price points um, so that we can make sure people can live. <laughs> so how we measure affordability, there's a couple different ways. Obviously there's that 30% measure, but another way to measure it is the, through looking at the housing wage. Um, the housing wage represents the hourly wage a full-time worker must earn in order to afford to rent a modest two-bedroom apartment. Um, and the ma average rent in Albemarle County is $1,264 per month for um, a two-bedroom apartment. And so that puts the housing wage at $24.30 per hour. So that health, home health aid obviously does not fit into that. Um, approximately 53% of all workers in the county earn less than that. Uh, so there's a lot of people that can't afford to live here on their own. Obviously, many people um, have more than one wage earner in their family or, or household. So that makes up that difference. But if it's a, a, a young student who just came out of um, college and trying to start out, um, they may not be able to afford to live here on their own without having roommates. Um, and so looking at $24.30 per hour and the $1,264 per month rent, um, a worker who is earning this minimum wage would need to work 99 hours per week in order to afford that rent. Um, so that's obviously more than one full-time job. That's two full-time jobs plus a little extra. Uh, looking at the housing wage, so it's that $24.30 per month, um, which comes out to be about $50,000 per year. Um, this is just representative of the types of um, jobs that earn that salary. And so many of our, our police officer recruits, when they start out, uh, start out below $50,000 per year, as do many um, teachers. School bus drivers, obviously the home health aid, um, our landscapers. So there's a lot of the, the, the workers that we rely on. Um, I think they're, we're calling them essential workers still, perhaps after the pandemic, um, that, that really cannot afford to live here unless they have more than one worker in their household. Um, so HUD looks at, uh, they, they set what are called fair market rents every year, and those are the rents that HUD, the federal government, considers to be affordable. Um, and you see those at the bottom of the screen. So the two-bedroom rent, um, again, is $1,264. And so that does not cover all those new apartment units that are being built, the sort of high-end things. These are really pretty basic apartment buildings but that um, these numbers are based on. And so looking at who lives in affordable housing, um, this is the, the purple square, uh, represents the income levels that county housing policy targets, um, specifically housing wise. We try to cover everybody, but um, most of the housing policy focuses on that 60 to 80% area median income range. Um, we are looking at workforce housing, or that's going to come in the future, we need to tackle our affordable housing issues um, first and get those programs in place. Um, and looking at homeless, homeless services, so emergency shelters and transitional housing, those are really important as well. Um, but there are different pots of federal money that can be used to do this. So that's not where we're, we're trying to focus our, our local dollars. We help with those, but that's not the primary focus. Um, so, for affordable housing programs, the federal government sets income limits. And in general, in order to, uh, to qualify for an affordable housing program, whether that's the housing choice voucher program or moving into a low income housing tax credit property like the Brookdale Apartments, um, you're looking at 80% AMI. And so it's this bottom row down here, um, area median income, really covers our entire region. So it's not just Albemarle County, but it looks at uh, the city of Charlottesville, Green, Nelson. I don't think Louisa is, in, is included in ours. I'll have to check on those. But um, so this covers a, a larger place than just Albemarle County. 
But as of April of this year, our area median income is now $111,200. And so you have, um, if you're a family of four, you can qualify for affordable housing if your household income is $83,850 annually. So these have, that's been a huge jump um, as of last year. This has increased about 17% over those numbers from last year. So, so there's been a huge increase. Um, that means even more people in Albemarle County qualify for affordable housing now than they did this time last year. Um, and that's independent of the pandemic. And so the types of occupations, uh, looking at that 80% AMI category, and for one person, that would be a special education teacher, a police officer, or a mail carrier would fall into that category. Um, but again, the home health aid, cashiers, child care workers at that very low end, security guards, bus drivers, um, there's a range of people that actually qualify for affordable housing that we would not probably typically think do. I always think it's important to talk about what affordable housing looks like. Um, I know that there are a lot of perceptions out there of what it is, and they tend to look like this, right? So it's the traditional public housing that was built in the 60s and 70s and 80s. It's run down, not cared for, uh, tends to be really high density. And so looking at here in the top left, that's from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. That's not actually um, public housing, that's, that's just, how affordable housing that was built. Um, but then you have East Lake Meadows next to that, and that's in Atlanta. Um, that was one of the worst public housing developments in the country until they renovated it. And then Cabrini Green in Chicago is at the bottom. Um, so it's a big difference from then and now. Um, these are actually three of these uh, pictures are from here. So you have the Thomas Jefferson Community Land Trust, and I think they just changed their name to Piedmont Community Land Trust, um, and that's in the upper left-hand corner. They built a few duplexes on Nassau Street in the city. They sold for $215,000 per unit. They are 100% um, energy efficient. They have high efficiency appliances. They came with solar panels on the roofs. Um, so the, the, not only did they sell for an affordable price, um, but the, the home buyers are saving tons of money on their, their um, utility bills. Uh, next to that is Habitat for Humanity, as many of you are probably familiar with, and that's one of the homes that they built within the area. Park Properties built the Brookdale Apartments, and those are, um, gosh, I think they're off of Raya Road somewhere, I believe. <laughs> Thank you, Diana. <laughs> Um, and then just to show uh, another example, truck development, that's Dinwiddie Housing, and that's again in Pittsburgh. Um, truck development does a lot of affordable housing, and they do mixed income housing. So they frequently build market rate housing and combine those market rate units within them. <clears throat> so looking at housing needs in the county, um, I have two different sets of numbers for you, I believe. Um, but to look at as of 2018, um, which is the most recent data from um, Department of Housing and Urban Development, you have um, approximately 11% of the population that um, needs affordable housing is extremely low income. And, and that 30% AMI and less category is really difficult for us to address in the county. Uh, we do not have a public housing program, um, which would be subsidized to the federal government. So while we do have a housing choice voucher program, there's a limited number of those vouchers. Um, and so I think we are currently serving approximately 400 households with those, which is great, but we have a limited numbers. Um, as you go up that income scale, that 30 to 60% AMI range, that is really tackled with the low income housing tax credit properties like Brookdale. Um, and 80% AMI, that's where you get into um, almost market rate, but not quite. But all of these represent the number of households that are paying more than 30% of their income for housing. Um, and so you can see renters, which is that, um, I don't know what color it is on your screen, kind of gray, uh, brownish on mine. 
they tend to have the, they struggle the most with their housing costs. Um, so looking at cost burden households, um, there's actually homeowners and renters on here. I pardon the, the mistake in the title. Uh, so about two out of every 10 homeowners is paying more than 30% of their income for housing. Um, but every three and five renters with the lowest household incomes are severely cost burdened. And that means that they are paying 50% or more of their income each month for their housing costs. Um, and that is projected to uh, grow. So by 2040, about one every four households will experience housing cost burden. So 30% or more of their income on housing, but three out of every four households will be paying at least half of their income or more for their housing out in 2040. And so that's why it's pretty important that we had a new housing policy. Um, which the board adopted last July. So we titled it a very original housing album oral. Um, and the housing policy listed six priority activities. Um, and so one is looking at county land that could be used for affordable housing. One is coming up with a package of incentives to support private developers in, in, in building affordable housing. Uh, adopting an affordable dwelling unit program ordinance um, that is under development. The, the board will be um, presented with a resolution of intent to uh, do a zoning text amendment, um, and that will be going to them on Wednesday. And as long as they pass that, then we can start work on that. Um, looking to find ways to create a self-sustaining housing fund. Uh, so instead of relying on um, whatever money the board can find through the budget process to place into the housing fund each year, find a, a source of income that, that just goes in there automatically. Creating a housing advisory committee um, that would bring a, a bit more of the community input into um, different types of programs that we could try and, and help keep the county accountable. So are we doing what the housing policy said we would be doing? Um, and then also uh, an additional permanent supportive housing project. Um, and so that provides house, affordable housing and services to individuals experiencing homelessness. And that I am happy to report is underway. That is the Premier Circle project, um, actually. So they are getting ready to start that, I believe. Um, other activities that are happening in the short term, um, there has been funding support from the county provided for the construction or preservation of affordable housing. So um, there has been money um, funding for the Southwood redevelop Redevelopment Project, and that's to cover, um, we'll support a total of 438 units in there. The Premier Circle Project, um, which Right now, um, we have dedicated funding for the first 80 units, but there will be an additional 60 affordable units coming in the future. Um, and Brookdale Apartments, we have a, a performance agreement with them at the moment where the county is providing property tax rebates over the next um, 15 years or so. <laughs> and that was to support the construction of 96 affordable units. And Stacy, I'm going to interrupt because a better description of where Brookdale is, rather than I nodded my head, it really is more towards Old Lynchburg Road and down in that area. That's right. I was thinking of the wrong. I, was, I, I nodded my head, but I wanted to expand and correct myself. <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> Um, we are, are working on creating a waiting list for proper units. So um, as many of you know, when private developers come in and ask for a rezoning, the county asks that um, they, they provide 15% of those units as affordable housing. Um, and I'm sure some of you also know that many of the for sale proper units do not actually go to income qualified households. Um, so this waiting list will be a way for the county could to, to, to connect income qualified renters and buyers directly to those units that are coming online. So that's um, under development. I'm, I'm hoping to get that up and running soon. Um, initially, that will most likely be um, working with the police foundation and county staff until I work the bugs out <laughs> of every application process. And then we can open it up to the community. Um, 
We have implemented an affordable housing evaluation tool. So when those rezoning applications come in, they are reviewed and, and um, looking at the affordable housing component exactly to see whether or not that would be, um, how much impact it would have on, on the affordable housing needs. And those are included in the packets. Um, our housing office awarded 30 project-based vouchers to two housing developments. So one of those is Premier Circle. Another is Southwood Apartments. That will be another low-income housing tax credit project. We are continuing real estate tax relief for elderly and disabled homeowners and real estate tax exemptions for veteran homeowners. Um, and there is a new housing report that is tracking progress. Uh, that was also included in your packet. It's pretty simple at the moment. I hope to expand on that, but I just wanted to get something together so we could start tracking the numbers. Um, there's a whole lot more in housing policy, but that's where we are to date. And so I'll open that up for questions. Sorry, I see Bill's hand. Yeah, okay, sorry about that. Um, just a couple of questions. On that definition, 30% of the AMI, is that a pre-tax in, pre -tax income? Because somebody has a $100,000 uh, salary, they never see $100,000, you know, 10 or 15% is probably withheld. What's that definition based on? That's my first of two questions. It is based on pre-tax income, and, and you're right, that, that doesn't really give a true expression. So that's probably why some of us are spending um, more than 30%, right? Because you get at least 20% um, taken out of your taxes. And, and, and I know the lower incomes get, you know, it, most of their tax money comes back to them at the end of the year, but that comes in a lump sum and you've been struggling all year. So that lump sum doesn't last very long. Okay. And my other question is, I was looking over this uh, report that was attached to the um, agenda that was sent out, and there on the first page, you have this chart, number and percentage of cost burden households by income range, and I took that chart in each of the five categories there, income categories, took the number of cost burden households and sort of worked back to the larger number for total households, and what I get on that is, is the, the four bars up to $75,000 represent about 49% of the households um, in, in the total number. And I'm thinking, how does that square with 111,000 area medium income? It looks like it might be a little above 75,000, but not 111. Does, I, I couldn't quite see how they matched up. So the 111,000 again is, is the entire region. Um, and, and so it's not just Albemarle County, it covers Albemarle County, the city of Charlottesville, Nelson, Green. <clears throat> um, and so I honestly don't know how HUD calculates that number. They have a really long formula. Um, but that is part of the disconnect is, is that they're looking, that number covers the region um, but that is the number they use to provide housing assistance and determine who qualifies. So that's the number we have to go with. Yeah, I just would, wouldn't think that we were that much poorer than the rest of the, uh, the region. But, you know. <laughs> yeah, I, I have yet to understand exactly how that works. <laughs> Julian? Uh, I just have a question on the, um, the uh, fair market rental rate that you shared, Stacey. Yep. Is that is that a rate for that's for that's specific to 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 is it that it correlates to specific regions or is that amount for just a global amount across the, the country? No, that is specifically for our region. So okay. again, Albemarle, Charlottesville, Green, Nelson. Okay. Um, so, okay. Yeah, it, it changes. It, it's generally set by a metropolitan area. So it would be different in Northern Virginia, Richmond, um, Boston. It, it's different by metro area. I have a question. Um, you said, did you say in the presentation that the, the what's considered affordable includes the utility costs as well? It does for renters, but not for homeowners. Okay. 
So how would you characterize the, our water and sewer costs in our community? Do you look at our specific water and sewer costs at the rental and do you think they are reasonable? Um, so if we have, um, with, with the Housing Choice Voucher Program, um, voucher holders are provided a utility allowance. So those utilities are covered for them with federal dollars. Um, with private developers who are providing, are proffering affordable units in, in their projects, when they set the rent, um, so they, they look at the affordable rent, they have to um, decrease that amount by a utility allowance. And that would cover water, sewer, electricity, gas, whatever they have that. So that's factored into the total rent developers are allowed to charge. But you are paying attention to our water and sewer costs within Albemarle County? Uh, well, they are, they're, the Virginia Housing, which used to be VHDA, um, calculates utility allowances for metro areas in uh, Virginia. So they do that by the, it's very weird, the number of exposed walls in your unit. So if you have a center unit, um, and it's a townhouse, and you would have two exposed walls, right? Front and back. And so that's how they calculate those. And those are the numbers that we provide to the um, developers who then determine which utilities the tenant will have to provide themselves. So it may be everything is electric, um, water, sewer, and there are specific amounts that they need to subtract per month from the monthly rent for those. And then uh, along those lines, do you, so I am aware that the Brookdale development was a unique um, opportunity to then meter specifically units. It was, a, it was another approach to allowing the individual renter to know exactly how much they were spending on their water and sewer costs rather than it being divided some arbitrary way. Do you know whether that has been a good strategy in terms of how an apartment complex manages the utility costs overall in a fairer way? I think, um, I, yes and no. Um, I, I think for individual renters, so they, they've now started doing that where I live. Um, I think for individual renters, it can be better. Um, so if you are, uh, you know, a 76 year old um, woman living by yourself, you're not going to use very much water. Whereas the family next to you may be two adults and five kids, and they're going to use way more water. So <clears throat> it is fairer in that respect. It is more difficult for that family of five. Um, to potentially pay off for all of their utilities and makes their housing less affordable. So it, it's, I can go, I'm not giving you a definitive answer. I can go either way on that one. <laughs> uh, Vito. You got to unmute me, Vito. The, this presentation you made obviously is interesting. And I assume you can make it for every single county and town in the state of Virginia. And I want, I want, how do we, uh, is our issue more severe than other places? Um, or is it pretty much the same as this? We are, we are better than some places. We are, um, I'm going to say we're kind of more in line with Northern Virginia, to be honest. Richmond is cheaper than we are. <laughs> And the, and the income might be less in place, place like Martinsville. You would think they'd be really have a big need. Yes. Um, <laughs> say that I can look it up real quick. Let me check. Um, I believe Northern Virginia. So they look at that entire metro area with Washington, D.C. included in it. Um, I think they're... Um, Let's 
Davida, one of the questions you're asking is everybody is struggling with affordable housing. They are. Yes, that's right. Exactly. So, Northern Virginia, the area median income is currently $142,300. Um, and so their fair market rents are going to be as higher than ours are. I think they might be um, $500 to $1,000 more than what ours are set at, depending on um, the size of the unit. Um, Richmond, the city of Richmond, their um, area median income is $101,000. So we are somewhere in between the two of those. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Yeah, I got a quick one. <clears throat> um, you mentioned that Albemarle didn't have a, I can't remember the terminology, but didn't have like a, a housing department. So we didn't qualify for a variety of vouchers. And yet it seems like given our urban ring that we have a, a high need. Um, is What's the reason for us not having that? So we, we, we have a help, our Office of Housing uh, manage, administers the Federal Housing Choice Voucher Program. So we have that. What we don't have is a public housing program um, like the city of Charlottesville does. So CRHA has um, Preston Halls and South First Street um, that is specifically geared towards extremely low income households. Um, we do not, th that had to be done through a referendum vote, which I believe happened way before I got here. Early 2000s maybe was the last time. Um, and that did not pass. That's why we are only administering the voucher program. Housing choice vouchers are um, issued by HUD and there is a formula that they use to determine how many vouchers any program can have. And, and I'm not entirely certain what that's based on. Um, there are ways we can get additional vouchers. So HUD will put out um, different vouchers for different groups of people. So there have been some mainstream vouchers that we have looked at and those have been uh, that we, I think we got 15 of those a year or two ago and those were for um, persons with disabilities um, and help them move into housing. They have just sent out a notice um, that is for um, youth moving out of foster care um, to help them uh, make sure that they can have housing and those would be that those would provide 36 months so three years of, of assistance uh, to help them transition from foster care to adult independent living so that's how we pick up more um, part of the way they I think they base the numbers of vouchers that you get is on um, population so uh, my guess is as the county's population grows um, we would probably expand the program automatically but yeah, you know, it's the challenge of Albemarle being not necessarily equal to Green and Nelson and some of the surrounding more rural counties, and yet we're sort of lumped in. So it it moves the averages against us to some degree. Uh, and you know, I I know that's a perennial challenge that we have across the school board and the county with the with the state and the federal government, particularly with our relationship with the city in terms of revenue sharing. So, I mean, there's two, you know, one is it's, you know, as we just talked about refugees and, 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 and people who are moving here, you know, moving more and more into the county, it's just, it's putting more and more pressure in the urban ring or urban rings, if you will, if you want to include Crozet. Um, <laughs> um, but, you know, it's just one of those things, like I know that there's been attempts to lobby locally at, at, the nat at the state level. I know that, I don't know how much effort there is at the national level, but it's, it's, it's really a challenge for us in an urban, you know, we're partially urban. We live in a very expensive area. Our, you know, the average environment here, we have a disparate amount of super high income. So when you look at average incomes, you, you know, I think what's more important is, you know, the percentage of the total population that is at those levels. And you were saying 40, 50%, that's mind blowing given dry, you know, it's, it's a lot of people who are really struggling in a small area of our county. It's just, you know, it kudos to the work that everyone's doing, trying to help make that easier. It's a super challenge. And I, I really nod, nod to 
the school board for the efforts of adopting and supporting all those kids and the county board for for trying to deal with it and, and keeping our tax rates just much lower than they really should be in my opinion um but I, it's a it's a really challenge i really appreciate you speaking to this and it's one of the it's it's i'd love to get that i feel like the message isn't out there in some of our communities it's, it's a real struggle for a lot of people and um if you don't live near it or you're not in a school system that is dealing with it it's it's out of sight out of mind so i appreciate the work you're doing and i, I think it's something all of us should be you know really cognizant of and, and and do what we can to support it thank you thanks john uh kate just fi a final question, Stacy. I mean, we struggled on the school board to raise our minimum wage to $15, which given the, at the housing wage, there's an enormous gap there <laughs> if that is $24. And we also try as a goal to have all the training that we do with our KTEC students if they come out with a living wage. But certified nurse associates, they're not even close to a living wage. And it, even our bus drivers, which you've all read about, we having extraordinary difficulties. There's a very well-produced commercial for the city school bus drivers that just hit, I think, a week or so ago. Um, but even with that, they're talking $18 an hour. Um, you know, one of the unintended consequences, I think, of the Affordable Care Act was we used to be able to dangle health insurance to our bus drivers, even if they weren't working full time. And that was a genuine benefit, but they can get health care anyway now. So, yeah, we're, we're a long way off from a housing wage with our low income workers. And when we raised the minimum wage, we had about 450 of our 2,500, 2,700 employees that were below that, that we had to lift up. But we've got work to do. And I'm with John, we probably aren't paying enough taxes. And I will say that um, <laughs> certainly the school system is more impacted with the number of people challenged with the living wage than the county government side is. We have some challenges, but the vast majority of those employees certainly are on the school side, which really gives the school system a challenge. I will say that when it comes to the bus drivers, we've got to start thinking about things differently. We can't continue to play whack-a-mole. 50 cents here, 25 cents here, and back and forth with John and everybody. We have to start thinking about how to combine systems, how to look at a regional transit authority, we have to start thinking differently and get out of that mindset of just, we're gonna raise this one five cents and this one 10 cents. <laughs> because if we can get everybody under the same umbrella, then everybody has the same pay raise, right? Pay, pay, same benefits. And then we can start looking at how that would also help us reduce the number of buses we need and the number of bus drivers. And I'm gonna stop because we're running out of time. <laughs> And I'm going to turn it back over to Kim because there we do have a couple of other issues. Um, Stacy, this was lovely. I'm sure our group may want you to come back. <laughs> Anytime. Thank yeah, thanks again, Stacy, for coming you. out. Um, all right. Uh, so we'll do our uh, updates. Um, you, uh, Julian, <laughs> Diantha, you have a preference of who goes first. I can. Well, why don't you give a quick update? Okay. Uh, anything about Charlotte Humphreys? All right, I can do I can do that since um, it, yeah. So we did our uh, May twenty first cleanup, our first scheduled sort of rah rah, let's do something in the park kind of day, and it was really really hot. Um, however, we managed to stay, but we got uh, the four hours in, and uh, I want to say thanks to. Bill Love for coming out. Uh, Yolanda Speed came out. Rosemary and her family came out. Her two boys came and helped. Um, Julian and his wife came out. So um, thank you so much for your support. And um, we were able to just focus along the Whitewood Road and created um, a whole bunch of little piles that uh, the Parks and Rec folks said they will bring a chipper out and then chip in place. Um, they had also brought out a trailer for us uh, the day before, so we had access to some wheelbarrows and tools. 
And Rosemary, I did eventually get that tree branch down. Okay, so. I saw. Yes. I saw. <laughs> um, so anyway, uh, if, you, if you're over there and you see a bunch of piles, hopefully they will get chipped soon, sooner here. And um, I was also told that the door on the little library is going to get fixed as well. So that was taken off because they were going to get new Lexan or some other covering for it. So anyway, um, thanks again for support. Sorry if the doodle poll thing didn't work out and it was confusing in some way. I've never um, done one of those. So I will try to figure out uh, how to better get that out in the fall if anybody's interested in doing this again. And um, yeah, that's my update. Okay, I'm going to go quickly because we're running out of time and I'm just going to talk about a couple of things that I really need to share with you. And I am sorry I missed the event. I was quarantining and you probably didn't want me there anyway since I had to quarantine. <laughs> but anyway, um, we have an opportunity that over at Greer Elementary opportunity to water. So over at, El at Greer Elementary, the, the master gardeners have built an exquisite, wonderful garden that is surrounded by a fence, they are using to teach the Greer students, the, the uh, fourth and fifth graders, classes around gardening. It is so cool, but they have a problem because the children have planted all these wonderful vegetables and, uh, and they need help in watering this summer so everything doesn't die. They reached out to me, well, actually I was over there and they were explaining the problem because I went over to visit one day. They were explaining the problem. So I am going to ask um, Carolyn or someone to send out a link. They have a sign up sheet, a link that you can go online and sign up to water. And they're asking for volunteers who could go over twice in one week, just to sign up for a week to go over twice to water their garden, right? So we can keep it alive. This is my week to do it. And um, the link sort of tells you everything you need to know. There's water, there's hoses there and you can water. And obviously um, I'm happy to answer any questions, but it would be, it is kind of a nice thing if we could help the, the Greer Elementary folks keep their garden alive <laughs> through the summer. Um, so I'll send out the link for that and answer questions. The other thing I wanted to let you know was that I received a communication today from the Boys and Girls Club they are now targeting an opening date of early 2023. Mm -hmm. I think some of us were thinking that they were gonna be opening in time for school to start this year. That's not gonna happen, uh, but early 2023 will be exciting. And right now they only have lacking for their construction, $800,000 of their targeted goal, which is really pretty great. Mm -hmm. Alcoa County, we approved a million dollars for them and they had a matching million from a private donor. So they're down to $800,000, which I think is pretty good. And so any tiny little bit helps. I'll give them a plug here. <laughs> and the main thing I wanted to talk about to with you is our next meeting. Because we're taking July off, remember? And we're going to be coming back together in August for our next meeting. And the date of that, if you want to put it on your calendar, will be August the 15th. We had chatted about the idea of getting together and taking a tour of the district. Mm -hmm. And Jody had kindly said that she would help us with a jaunt bus. So we can all ride on a jaunt bus together. Mm -hmm. Help me out. Is this what you all would still like to do? Is that does that sound like fun? Sounds like you're interested? Yeah. If you know. Is it, right. is it, do we get to use the electric bus? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's up to Jody. <laughs> I don't want, I want it to be in September. I'm not going to be here in August. Oh. Well, now that's up to you guys. We talked about August. I'm happy if Jody was, if that works for Jody, we can move it to September if that works for yeah, I mean, do it when it's best for everybody. But if there are a lot of other people that are going to be away, on holiday during that period of time, it'd be great. So I, I don't want to have to take a poll. Does anybody mind if we switch it to, to September? No. 
It seems like more people would be able to do it generally. People are more back in town for September. And it might be cooler, although September can be pretty hot. Jody, is that okay with you for September? I think so. Do you know? the date be in September? Oh, wait a yeah. minute. To, wait, wait, wait. I have to look at the county schedule for September. September, they have parks and green systems overview of existing and future parks trails. So the, the county has a pre-programmed um, agenda for us in September. The problem with doing it in August is technically we're not allowed to have in-person meetings till September. And are you going to have a bus big enough if, if the community, if anybody outside wants to come? We did not do that before. It was by invitation for the CAC. Let's do the parks thing in August. So I, I'm sorry. We, I don't think we have a choice, John. I will have to ask staff, but they have said that their schedule, they're going to give us a presentation on parks and green systems. I can call and ask if they would switch. Do you want me to do that? Yeah. I, let me contact staff, county staff, and see if they will do a switcheroo for us, right? Uh, if that's what you all would like. And we can communicate by email. Mm -hmm. but think what, what would be the date in September? It's well, we're always using the same meeting date that we have, which is the third Monday. Third Monday. So September yeah, would be the uh, 19th. The 19th? Yeah. Um, I'll be here. So it'll either be August or September. Let me see what county staff can do. Carolyn asked about what we did before, Carolyn, was that we had a bus and the CAC members met. We actually met at Greer and got on the bus. And then we had a, a, a um, staff member from, I guess, Parks and Rec, who drove us around the, the area of the CAC, right? And, um, uh, and just talked about the different um, places. We had some members of the CAC who had never even been on some of the streets. So I think people found it very interesting. And, um, but that would essentially be our meeting, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, it would take enough time to, to do that. We would also be able to go by Charlotte Humphreys Park, right? Mm -hmm. And we could even maybe take a quick look at Charlotte Humphreys Park while we were there, while we're doing this. Um, so if that works for everybody, I guess what I'll do is see if we can move it to September. We may not be able to. Um, the next open meeting would be October. So it would, so um, we could have another um, agenda in September and then have the, use the open meeting space in October and do the tour. So let me see what I can work out. Jody, I'm assuming you don't have a problem as long as you know ahead of time. Yeah, I just need to know, you know, an enough advance notice so that we can sort of work out our schedules um, for the operators and available buses. And then, you know, at some point, maybe a week before, or even a couple of days before, just knowing where we're actually going so we can give our, our operator a, a heads up. And but I yeah. have to arrange a tour operator of some sort, although while Julian and I can do some of it, we probably want someone from the that's a little bit more um, able to do us a, give us a tour too. So anyway, so yeah. work for everybody. Is that good? So we don't really have any decision yet. I'll get back to everybody by email. Okay. Karen, uh, work I for you. Okay. Sorry, I just wanted to check that the day of caring is, is it that same week, mm -hmm. but it's Wednesday. So that's not a conflict. And Carolyn, you're our guru. Does that everything okay for you? Because my understanding was that we'll be going back in person at the end of the summer, probably in, I thought in August, but maybe September. First. I'm sorry? I heard September 1st that we'd be back in yeah. person. And once you guys go in person, you won't have me anymore. Yeah, that's right. And I was hoping we'd be meeting at the Boys and Girls Club, but that's probably not going to happen. So we'll be, we'll have to decide if, if we had been meeting at Greer, if that works for everybody, we'll go back probably to Greer. And I've taken mm -hmm. time. So follow your emails and we'll see what we can figure out. All right. Thank Julia? you. So I just have two very quick things. One is um, you'll see invitations to the, so the first comp plan, public engagement. Those of you who are, who are, who are, um, taken by that subject, I would advise you to go to the public engagement pieces on that. 
Um, and those of you who don't know yet, I would advise you to go onto the county's website and put your name into the uh, on, on the mailing list so that you get those things sent to you. So that's on that one. Um, and it's, ex it's exciting. There's a, it's some, some good work and some good discussions coming out of that from our colleagues in the public. I'm simply a, a, an observer. I'm not engaged in that at, at this time, but I am there as an observer. The other thing, there was a number of conversations about a project that's been brought before the Planning Commission and the supervisors at some point, I suppose, on Old Ivy Road. Well, that project is coming before the Planning Commission tomorrow at our six o'clock meeting. So if that's something that you're interested in, there's always a way just go to our planning commission uh go to the planning commission website and it tells you how to log on those of you who don't remember there's a big piece of i think the faulkners had a big piece of property when you come off the bypass across from st anne's and go down old ivory road well um, a group of individuals have assembled several pieces of property there and they have a an idea to put a um a rental uh community there uh and so we'll know more tomorrow night so, um, Julian, I've had about 35,000 people, it seems like, ask me mm -hmm. how in the world could VDOT approve the amount of density which they are anticipating on that parcel. And the uh, property is owned by the Heishmans, who mm -hmm. developed um, Huntington Village, Huntington Village. Garden, yep. University Village. Yep. So I would say, Jane, that some some of the people who are asking you those questions are not fully informed um that vdot has not weighed in yet on this nor would they weigh in on this at this particular point in time and so people as as i've come to see people jump ahead of things without with, with simply having a, a kernel of information what you maybe want to tell some of those individuals that there is a proffer on this piece of property that was that was set down on it in 1985 that had that where the super where our supervisors were very clear about what kind of conditions would need to change on on old ivy road and on, and that the supervisors would be the ones to say that the those conditions have changed and so right now vdot is vdot weighed in at that point but it did not offer an opinion and it did not say that this project um it did not offer an opinion on this project um, and said that, and in fact, it supported it supported what the supervisors said in 1985. That has not changed. That has not changed. Um, and so, right now, we're going to hear we'll, the, the present. We'll get a presentation tomorrow from from both staff and the applicant about what they're hoping to do there. And then the planning commission will. I would also recommend that you suggest people to look at the staff report because the staff report is very clear that they are not recommending approval of this project. So I would suggest that you perhaps might be helpful to some of your people who've been contacting you to say that they might want to read the staff report. And that's available, you know. Online, is right there online. Planning Commission's website. So all you have to do is go to the Planning Commission and look for our meeting tomorrow, which is the meeting on 614. And look at our agenda and then there's a hyperlink to the report on on that on that and i i think if i i'm just suggesting to people read the document first and see what it says from that that's all i'm all that's all i will permit myself to say on that john bill bill how's your how's your how's your your yeah. wrist how's your wrist it's oh, good. okay <laughs> um no i just hope i assume somebody's taking a careful look at the impact of traffic. I lived on Old Ivy Road for three years when I was in law school. Mm -hmm. and I never went through that railroad pass simultaneously with a car coming from the other direction. So if they throw a whole lot more vehicle traffic on that road, it should, it would be quite interesting. So I will say, like I said to Jane, I would suggest that everyone go to the Planning Commission website and look at the look at the look at the uh, the meeting for tomorrow. <clears throat> Click on the hyperlink that will take you to that report. I think, Jane, you mentioned that, uh, at our last meeting that people were sort of creating um, uh, they were creating a lot of anxiety for themselves. Oh my God! And I, I'm just going to say again, <laughs> direct all those people to that report, and I think that may bring some of their anxiety now. Damn. Yes. All right. Uh, anybody else say anything else we want to add before we close this meeting? 
Just a little bit about schools. Kate, Kate, oh, sure. Kate, go ahead. Just um, school is out. We, Diantha and I went to three. I went to five different graduations, just as a rule of thumb. We have about a thousand students per level. So we said, welcome to adulthood to, adulthood to almost a thousand students. Uh, a second piece of news is that we have preliminary results from our SOLs and everyone has been panicked about catastrophic learning loss because of hybrid or online learning. Our scores are at or better than they were in 1819. Mm -hmm. So the good, and that is for every group. I mean, it's our, our African-American students, it's our special ed students in both, much more so for reading than for math, but math also. So, mm -hmm. so the good news is that we're not digging out of a, a bigger hole. Um, we still have an achievement gap that we're working on, but at least we can start. Uh, we're very, very appreciative of the huge amount of work our teachers have done and our students and families. So that was a bit of good news. And then just one little bit. It looks like Greer is going to continue to be Greer Elementary. We haven't voted on it yet, but that was the community and superintendent's recommendation. So we, uh, can, we can just focus on getting used to saying journey middle school, otherwise we're good. And I, I never could figure out why they took Jack Jewett out. Just Look at the history of Jack Jewett and how many slaves he owned. Over yeah, the long I mean, the, the, the direct, from the school board was to look at all schools with a person's name and to see if um, what they could glean. And Bill was on the Jewett committee. Um, and I think we've now done six or seven schools. And to see if, um, you know, that history, which as we all know in, in Virginia can be checkered, uh, to say the least, um, still conforms with where we are. And um, the school board, after giving that directive, we stay out of it. Uh, and it's a committee of students and teachers and community members, family members. And Bill knows more about how it actually operates than I do. But, um, and, and in the end, uh, you know, there's students and, and the community votes on it. Um, so we've kept some of the names and replaced some of the names. That's about the end of it. We've kept a Virginia Murray Elementary. We've kept, um, it looks like Greer. Uh, I would expect Greer, but we've changed a couple as well. The challenge is when you name buildings and streets after people in decades and decades. Yeah. Go by. It's just much first... easier if it's Western Albemarle High School. That's sort of unambiguous. <laughs> We, we, we shouldn't look to see what Lord Elmore did, though. What? Whether Lord oh, Elmore... you're right. You're right. I guess... We could get in trouble. <laughs> well, that's a county name. I don't know if that was... <laughs> yeah. Diantha wants to know whether we changed the magisterial district's name. So, um, so it's, we're way over time. I'm not trying to shut down, but it, I'm trying... You know, I'm good. 714, I know people have to... All right. So... Again, the watering of the garden, if anybody's interested that way. Thank you. All right. So again, uh, no meeting in July. Next meeting will be August 15th, agenda yet to be determined. Opportunities for the public to access and participate in the electronic meeting will be posted at a later date in accordance with emergency ordinance number 20-A16 and open meeting requirements of the Virginia Freedom of Information Act. I hope you all have a lovely evening and take care. Good night. Good night. Have a great July. Be safe.